In this lecture, we're going to discuss and explore hyperbolic functions. Now, up until now, we know about the six trig functions, which also known as circular functions, the trig functions that we are already familiar with. Those are sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. We already have worked with them. We found their inverses, we defined their inverses, so in all, we had 12 of those circular functions combined with their inverses. In section 6.6, .6, we're going to talk about hyperbolic functions. Now the reason uh, the sine, cosine, tangent, and so on, those were called circular functions because they represent the coordinate of a point on a circle. Likewise, if we uh, indicate the coordinates of points on the right branch of a hyperbola given by the equation x squared minus y squared equal 1 then we get the graph of uh, th that you see right in here on the right side we see that right branch of a hyperbola and the coordinates of the point that are on that are defined as hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine notice on the circular portion the coordinates of a point on the circle could be represented uh, as cosine t sine t and the coordinates of a point on the branch of the hyperbola could be uh, determined as cosine hyperbolic t and sine hyperbolic t now the measure of t here by the way t is the measure of the angle so in in these figures like in this one that's where t is there you go and same thing with this one that's that's what t is there okay now uh, that's why they're called hyperbolic functions and the, you kind of read about it in here also in that passage now interesting applications of this function when i have these uh, graphs that i that i copied uh, from the web so the first one is actually interesting is the shape of a dangling chain so that chain notice there are no forces acting on it other than the gravity and the weight of each link of that chain so uh, same thing with this one you have a hanging cable with no external forces acting on it so those are examples of uh, modeling using hyperbolic functions and finally, in this part, part B, if you look at uh, the equation of a pursuit curve uh, of a missile, uh, that would be this curve. It follows a hyperbolic function. Okay, so those are interesting examples, simple basic examples um, that are modeled or could be modeled using hyperbolic functions. Now, so that's the subject of this lecture. Then we're going to uh, define these six hyperbolic functions as following. Sine hyperbolic x is defined as e to the x minus e to negative x divided by 2. Cosine hyperbolic e to the x plus e to negative x divided by 2, so on and so forth. Notice that just like in the circular portion uh, segment, uh, we do have these reciprocal identities just like we had with uh, regular trig functions which we call circular functions so if you recall tan x was the ratio of sine to cosine x so that's exactly the same here they've defined them to be the same to be consistent so that makes sense cotan the co cosine divided by sine and of course these are all h for hyperbolics so cosecant hyperbolic x is these are the reciprocal identities that still work uh, with hyperbolic functions. Now, as far as the pronunciation, the correct pronunciation of these hyperbolic functions, um, first we have sine hyperbolic. That's the way you pronounce it is cinch. So sine hyperbolic, we call that cinch x. The cosine hyperbolic of x, that would be cosh that would be pronounced as cosh x. So we have cinch x, we have cosh x. Now as far as the other four, four goes, so we talked about cinch cosh. Tangent, the way it's pronounced is pronounced as tench. 
tinge x. Cosecant, secant, and cotangent hyperbolics. Well, cotan hyperbolic, it's cotange. Secant hyperbolic would be sech x, and cosecant hyperbolic is pronounced as cosech. So again, to wrap it up, we have cinch, cosh, tanch, cosech, sech, and cotange hyperbolics of x. All right, so that's just to get the pronunciation done correctly. They do sound funny a bit, but that's, that's how they are. Now, as far as their graphs goes, this is very interesting. And there you go. That would be the graph of these um, hyperbolic functions. So the graph of sinh x, and you can see, uh, you can write that sinh x as sum of two exponential functions, e to the x minus e to negative x. And of course, you scale it by dividing by 2. But it's uh, fundamentally is the combination of two exponential functions. Now, e to the x, remember, that's this one. That's e to the x. And negative e to negative x is this one. So once you combine those two, combine is what you see the graph of cinch seems to be. There you go. So it's going to shoot up very fast, like that. So that would be the graph of cinch. The graph of cosh, likewise, combination of two exponential functions. It's not a parabola, although it looks like a parabola, doesn't it? Because if you actually superimpose a parabola on top of that, the parabola more or less will look like this. That's the basic parabola. Be because you have this exponential effect, so this is going to shoot right up kind of like that, whereas the parabola is going to go more like this. Okay, so uh, those would be called, let's say, branches, if you call it the branches of hyperbolic cosine that cosh, uh, are the branches are exponential branches, not parabolic. And one thing that you can immediately uh, get from the, from these two graphs is that the graphs are not periodic. Remember, for sine and cosine, you have periodic. They repeat after a certain period. That's not the case with the hyperbolic functions because they're a com combination of exponential functions. So they do not cycle through <clears throat> a certain period. And that's what I have in my note here. So please note that these are not like circular functions in that they do not have a period. And the graph of tanj, and this is the graph of cosage, cotanj, and sech x. So these are very interesting models. Uh, the sech x, if you notice, sech x looks like almost a normal distribution. The Gaussian distribution looks like that. So a sech x is a good model for that. <laughs> And also tangex, if you look at tangex, hyperbolic tangent, this one mimics the graph of arctan. So if you if you take a look at, uh, maybe go back to your notes, look at uh, tan inverse x, or graph this and look what it looks like. And the, the main difference, of course, are the exact coordinates. For arctan, this would be pi over 2, this would be negative pi over 2, but it looks exactly the same. Okay. So that's interesting. These two uh, are very interesting for me. One models a Gaussian distribution. The other one al almost models uh, an inverse tan tangent. Okay. Now, um, here we have, again, a display of all six of those hyperbolic functions. Uh, so cinch, cosh, tanch go together. And these three, notice, they go together. They kind of lump together that way. Now, as far as the work going forward, you seldom see anything in, involving cosage, sech, and cotange. Okay, we could make a case where these could be modeled for certain, let's say, data patterns and so on and so forth. So we could definitely use them in modeling, but as far as we are concerned, our primary focus is on, on those hyperbolic functions. Okay, and uh, also in like second, third semester calculus, you don't tend to work as much with these hyperbolic functions, but uh, this is the last section for us, so we're going to cover this. Next, we're going to come to a barrage of formulas, if you call them, or identities. Now, there's very interesting identities that you'll see here. 
these identities tend to kind of mimic one another. So the ones that I have uh, crossed out in here are the ones that are repeated. So here we go. Um, the negative angle identities, cinch negative x is negative cinch x. That's exactly just like the sine. Remember sine? Sine of the negative angle is equal to a negative sine of the angle, right? And there you have it. Which uh, shows when f of negative x equals negative f of x, that means the graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. And indeed, for cinch, there is the graph, that's the origin, symmetric with respect to origin. So cinch is an odd function. <clears throat> Cosh, just like cosine, is an even function, symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Tench is also an odd function because sine is odd. So you have, remember, the ratio of cinch to cosh, right? Well, cinch is odd, cosh is even. So that combination creates an odd function, as long as one of the functions is odd. When you have odd-even combination, then the resulting function would be odd. So there you have it. Uh, these are all the identities. Now, typically, just just so you're aware, uh, in an online environment, of course, everything is open book, open notes. So, so that's not an issue here. But uh, in an in-class environment, usually, um, we don't make students memorize these. And you can see we got a whole bunch of formulas coming up. Um, if we if we start by introducing uh, exponential functions, these you can think of those as formulas. Of course, some of them are intuitive. Let me brush these aside because those again are similar to circular functions. But this part, there, there you go. That's a new definition, so we got to memorize that. And the point being, because we got so many formulas in this section, even in a classroom setting, we don't make students memorize them. Now, uh, the Pythagorean identity, that's interesting. Remember, in the case we'll, with circular functions, we know that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, right? Now, compare that to this one for uh, would-be Pythagorean identity, but it's not really. Uh, for hyperbolics, is done this way. That's as close as you come to Pythagorean with hyperbolic identities. Cosh squared minus cinch squared is one, not plus. So you got to be careful there, that there is a marked difference there. Um, Sech squared is one minus tanch squared, right? Well, the case with, um, again, with Pythagorean identity, we know sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Divide by sine squared, everything by sine squared. Uh, and we get the identity that is 1 plus, uh, let's see, I divide by sine, uh, okay. yeah, let's divide by cosine because I want a tangent. Divide cosine and cosine, sorry about being sloppy, but my point is something else here. So that's tan squared plus uh, 1 is equal to secant squared theta, right? Okay, so secant squared theta is 1 plus tan squared, right? So we know that. Um, and look at this one. So they're not exactly the same, right? Secant squared here, or I should say sech, sech squared doesn't equal 1 plus tan squared. So there are subtle differences <clears throat> in the identities that you got to be careful about. And the next two identities are the addition formulas for cinch and cosh. These uh, draw parallel with the uh, circular uh, counterpart of themselves. So if you recall, for example, sine of alpha plus beta uh, was stated as sine alpha cosine beta plus uh, sine beta cosine alpha. So that kind of uh, draws parallel. So that one is parallel to the circular version. And the same thing with, um, oh no, for uh, cosine of the sum, uh, that is the same also, right in here. So we have cosine, cosine, plus sine, sine, and that's what this one is. Okay. And the double angle identity, remember sine 2x two, two is 2 sine x cosine x, in the case of hyperbolic, cinch 
two x is two cinch x cosh x. So you can you can kind of read for your own. I'm not going to read every one of them with you. Uh, this is interesting. The relationship between uh, this is actually between circular functions. This is relationship between circular functions and hyperbolic functions. So as you can see, these are trig functions. The trig functions are sine, cosine, tan, cotan, secant, cosecant. And hyperbolic functions are on this side. These are all hyperbolic. So this is a pivotal uh, segment in that this is a very key, very interesting relationship between uh, circular and hyperbolic function. So notice they do involve i. i here is the imaginary unit. Okay, square root of negative 1. So sine of i z is equal to i times sinh z. Notice here the imaginary unit is removed. Okay, and, and there we have it. So um, we're not going to work with that hardly in this course. Okay, but it's just to have it. Right here, this is the proof of uh, this identity. Why is that cosh squared minus sinh squared is 1? To prove any one of these, by the way, identities, you go right back to the definition of sinh and cosh and do it. This is what definition of cosh is. That's what definition of sinh is. So you just write it, crank through the algebra, and, you know, a couple of steps later, you get expressions like these. You simplify them, and then you get some something. <clears throat> so there you have it. Sinh squared. Uh, cos squared minus sin squared is equal to 1. Um, some of the other identities that are not listed uh, in here are down here. Uh, more specifically, uh, these. These are actually there except with the exception of tangent. So these are already up there. So for example, if you look at, this is your familiar half angle formula, right? Uh, that's what this one is. Uh, those are repeated, so I don't want them. Uh, there you go. This is your half angle identity. Sinh squared half angle is equal to cosh x minus 1 over 2. This is actually up here, right in here. There you go. That's what that is. So if you look at that one and look at what is in here, you have cosh minus 1. There's cosh minus 1. Uh, and it's one half, and there is sinh squared. Uh, except in this version, in this version I'm circling, um, the half angle x over two is used. Okay, so if that's x over two, the half angle, then in front of a cosh, it's going to be twice that, which makes it x. So if up here, if would be the half angle is x, then what's in inside the cosh, the argument of cosh would be twice, twice that. So they are really the same. They're the same. But I just wanted you to see, I'm sure uh, this form, these resonate with you because you've seen them in your trigonometry classes. Okay. When it comes to derivative and integral of hyperbolic functions, uh, there you go. They're pretty simple, straightforward. And again, they do draw somewhat parallel to trig functions, these hyperbolic functions. Notice they don't call them trig functions, okay? Although they involve cosine sine, they're called hyperbolic, so they're not trig functions. There you go. When we say trig functions, we're talking about everything that you knew before this lecture. That means trig functions are the six functions and their inverses, sine, cosine, tan, and so on. These are hyperbolic functions, not trig functions. So, the derivative of cinch is cosh, cosh is cinch. That's easy to remember, isn't it? <laughs> so, there's no negative, like, unlike the cosine, like the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Not the case here. And because the derivatives are the same, the antiderivatives also work nicely. So, integral of cosh is cinch, integral of cinch is cosh. Derivative of tangent secant squared, remember that? Works the same way. So, the integral of cinch squared is tangent. Derivative of cosecant. Remember that was negative cosecant cotan. There it is, and this the next to it would be the antiderivatives. Derivative of secant. Now here's what's different. Derivative of secant um, was secant tangent for trig functions. Secant derivative of secant theta is secant theta tan theta. 
but there is a negative in here, so that's a marked difference. Uh, the derivative of cotangent, just like cotangent, uh, is negative cosecant squared. This would be negative cosec squared. Again, these formulas, we don't expect you to memorize them, even in the classroom setting. So no matter where you are, you'll be provided these. <clears throat> and then we take a look at their inverses. So inverse hyperbolic function, just like the way we define the inverse of circular or trig functions, they're defined the same way. Okay. And these are the domains. You don't have to restrict the domain uh, for uh, cinch, negative infinity to infinity. You do have to restrict the domain for uh, co cosh, for cosh from one to infinity. And because if you go back to the graph of cosh, remember it looked like a parabola? I like to look at this graph of it. There you go. Cosh is not a one to one function. So in order to make it one to one, uh, you look at. Uh, this portion of it okay and the function is one to one now the case with cinch see it's always a one to one over the entire domain so um, for uh, tang for example tangent uh, hyperbolic is one to one over its entire domain so um, with that you get these um, inverse functions so uh, again for cinch negative infinity to infinity um, these are the domain of them. Um, for cosh, it's from 1 to infinity. There you go. That's how they make it uh, 1 to 1 over these specified domains. Now, what I said for tangent, let me go back to tangent. There you go. The domain, the domain of tan hyperbolic is negative infinity to infinity. Range is negative 1 to 1 right because it's bounded now remember for the inverse we swap out the range and domain so this is going to be the range this will be the domain of the inverse hyperbolic tangent so this is what we're going to see when we go down look at the graph the domain they give you the domain i was thinking i was talking about the range being negative infinity to infinity uh, in this definition right in here they give you the domains uh, not the ranges i was looking at the ranges Okay, you don't have to memorize these again. Uh, these are the graphs. Notice we only see the graph of cinch inverse, cosh inverse, tangent inverse, but uh, they do exist for the other three inverse hyperbolics. And uh, next thing is actually, now this is the representation of hyperbolic function, inverse of hyperbolic function, um, using logarithmic functions. Because hyperbolic functions, are defined in terms of exponents so it makes sense for their inverses just like the inverse of exponential function is logarithmic function remember the inverse of e to the x is ln of x so it makes sense in the case of inverse hyperbolics that we have some kind of a logarithmic expression now i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna show you uh, this one okay how is that going to work how the cinch inverse how does natural log come into this right so to begin with i'm going to say let's say um let's call y equal uh cinch inverse x right now by definition of inverse that's directly above here there you go y equals cinch inverse if x equals cinch y so i'm just going to do that uh x equal cinch y okay now remember the definition of hyperbolic sine was e to the y negative e to negative y divided by 2 right that's what that was so in this equation let's multiply both sides by 2 so when we multiply both sides by 2 i'm going to go down here actually right it below this uh, block so this is going to be 2x equals e to the y negative e to negative y and then bring 2x to the other side so that means e to the y negative 2x negative e to negative y equals zero true now to get rid of e to negative y i'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by e to the y times e to the y and on the right side, of course, we get 0. 
uh, to the left, I'm going to get e to 2y, negative 2x e to y, negative e to 0. True? Because y and negative y add up to 0. Now e to 0, of course, is 1. So this equation becomes e to 2y, negative 2x e to the y, minus 1 equals 0. And this is actually an equation that is quadratic quadratic in uh, e to the y. If you want, I'm going to do this. I'm going to let m be e to the y. So m squared would be e to the y squared, which is e to 2y. And I'm going to rewrite the equation, this equation, as e to 2y, that's m squared, negative 2x m minus 1 equals 0. So that's what we have, a, an equation that is quadratic in m. So I'm going to use quadratic formula with a being 1, b is negative 2x, and c is negative 1, right? There's c, there's b, and there's a, right? Okay, <clears throat> using quadratic formula, the solution to m is negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2 times a. No sign of natural logs yet, right? Interesting how they just appear all of a sudden from thin air. 2x plus or minus square root of. That would be 4x squared plus 4 divided by 2, which I can factor a 4 from the radicand, bring it outside as a 2, and this becomes x squared plus 1 divided by 2. Next, I'm going to divide out all the 2s, right? Or you can cross them all out. If every term has it, we can divide it out. Or you can factor it from the numerator and do it that way. So here, m is equal to x plus or minus square root of x squared plus 1. Okay, now in here, we have two choices of plus minus, right? Remember what m was in here. m is what e to the y, right? Well, we know e to the y is positive, right? Let me write that here. Because exponential functions are always positive, right? There you go. That's the graph of e to the y. It's always positive, right? It's above 0 on the y-axis. So we know e to the y is positive. Well, if e to the y is positive, therefore uh, m, which represents e to the y, that means m has to be positive. So now remember what m is. x, if I go the positive root, x plus root, x squared plus 1, positive, the square root is positive, sum of positive would be positive, so we definitely want the positive root. So m is x plus root x squared plus 1. Now the case of a negative, x minus root x squared plus 1. Okay, now square root of x squared is square root of x squared is going to be x, right? The principal root. Now, when you add 1 to it in the radicand, when you add 1 to it, uh, that makes it even. So root x squared plus 1 is going to be bigger than x, isn't it? Because you're adding 1 more to the radicand. So it's going to be bigger than x. Well, uh, so if square root of x plus 1 is bigger than x in this expression, that means when you subtract x from the square root of x squared plus 1, you're going to end up with a negative number. And you can try it. Try it with a number. Let's say x is going to be, I don't know, uh, 3. 3 squared plus 1, 9 plus 1, 10. See, square root of 10 is bigger than 3, isn't it? And let's say it's 3.2, 3.1. That's going to be less than 0. So that's what we're saying without numbers. OK, so the point being, the negative is going to be discarded as a result. It's going to be less than zero, which contradicts with what we want. So we're going to discard the negative and only accept the positive root here. Now, let's go back and solve for y. m is equal e to the y. 
right? So now here's where logarithms come in. If m is equal to e to the y, then I can rewrite this in logarithmic form. That's where natural log comes in. Equivalent expression for this is log x base e equal y, right? Because if you raise e to the y, you get x. So that's what that is. True? So I'm just going to rewrite this expression using logs and change m with all of that. So let's do. That means x plus root x squared plus 1. There is m. Actually, I'm just going to save space. I'm just going to write the log version. Um, and instead of x, sorry, because I have m here. Usually we use x um, still with x. Okay, and there you go. Now log at base e, remember that's natural log, isn't it? So in other words, this is just ln of m equal y. That's what that is. If m is e to the y, that means natural log of m is y. So I'm going to write that. y, so I can say y is equal to ln of x plus root x squared plus 1. And what was y? y was cinch inverse, right? Okay, so I'm just going to write cinch inverse of x is equal to natural log x plus root x squared plus 1. So that would be the derivation, and there you go. That's one of the three expressions we had, ln of x plus square root. And there it is, ln of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. Okay, so that's, that's what those are. And next we're looking at derivative of inverse hyperbolic, so there's six more formulas there for you. These are the derivatives. And we're looking at a few integrals involving hyperbolics. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there we have four, two, four, ten more formulas for the integrals. We will explore these integrals further when it's time to do some integration problems. So, um, again, we don't have to memorize these. But uh, once we get to integration exercises, I'll come back and revisit this, maybe copy and paste it. Uh, but meanwhile, let's actually take a look at some exercises. Okay, let's take a look at these exercises. We're going to begin with exercise number two. Uh, in exercise number two, the question reads, find the value of the expression accurate to four decimal places. In part A of number 2, we want to find cosich of 3, in part B, tench of negative 2, and in part C, cotench of 5. Now, if you go back to definition of these, um, let me show you. When we first defined these hyperbolic functions, notice we have a specific uh, expression for cinch, uh, and cosh, but we do not have uh, similar expressions for the remaining hyperbolic functions. So what we need to do first is we need to, for example, if I'm doing tanj, I need to write that as it as a ratio of cinch to cosh, and then use the expressions, if you will, the formulas which define those to get uh, the expression in exponential form of those um, hyperbolic functions. So let's do number two. In exercise number two, we want to find, for example, cosich of three. So first I'm going to do cosich of x. Okay, so, so for cosich, remember that's uh, the reciprocal identity, that's one over cinch x. So again, using the formula which defines cinch, it was e to the x minus e to negative x divided by 2 so you just invert it and now we can actually directly substitute so cosage of 3 would be 2 divided by e cubed minus e to negative third power and then you just uh, 
use your calculators to find these uh, values for the denominator when I did I got 20.0357 the exercise asked us to round it to four decimal places so to four decimal places I got a 0 0.998 okay so that's number two part a in part B of number 2, we want to find tanh of negative 2. So first, I need to find tanh of x, which is the ratio of sinh to cosh of x. So tanh x is going to be, remember, sinh is e to the x minus e to negative x divided by 2, and then divided by cosh, but then cosh is e to the x plus e to negative x divided by 2. And the 2's of course divide out here. You can cancel, cross out the 2's in the expression. And the exponential form of tanh is e to the x negative e to negative x divided by e to the x plus e to negative x. And now we are in a position to evaluate tanh function. So tanh of 4, right, that's what we wanted to do in part number 2. Oh, I'm sorry, tanh of negative 2. Tanh of negative 2 is going to be e to negative 2 minus e squared, because double negative makes positive, over e to negative 2 plus e squared. Now for this, uh, let me put down step the numerator just so you can check your work against mine for the numerator I got negative 7.25372 over the denominator which is 7.52439 and round it to four decimal 0 0.9640 okay uh, let's do the last part which is to find cotanh of 5. So I need to find again cotanh of x. Now cotanh is 1 over tanh, right? And we found the expression for tanh, which is this. So I'm just going to use that. Cotanh x is going to be e to the x plus e to negative x and divided by e to the x minus e to negative x. Good. And that's, that's what that becomes. Now for a specific value, when x is 5. So cotanh of 5 is going to be e to the 5th plus e to negative 5 divided by e to the 5th minus e to negative 5. The numerator ended up being 148.419897 and the denominator ended up being 148 0.40642 and to the nearest ten thousandths turns out to be that and there is number two for you okay next take uh, let's take a look at number six in number six we want to find uh, inverse hyperbolic tangent so that's tanh inverse or arc tanh of negative a half cosh inverse and tanh inverse of sinh is zero. So let's take a look at number six. Okay. So in exercise number six, again, part A is to find tanh inverse of negative one half. Now, we had formulas for these also using the logarithmic form of these uh, inverse functions. So this would be one half natural log of the formula is one plus x. So I go one plus negative one half divided by one minus x, one minus negative one half. And uh, this would be one half natural log of, in the numerator I have a half, in the denominator I get three halves. And a half divided by three halves is one third. So that's one half ln of one third, which is going to be one half uh, ln of one minus ln of three. 
natural log of 1 is 0, so it's 1 half uh, times negative natural log of 3. Now, ln of 3 is going to be uh, 1.0986 negative a half times 1.0986 and that's going to give me negative 0.5493 rounded to the nearest ten thousandths that's what approximately turns out to be that's your tange inverse in part b we want to find the cosh inverse of natural log of five so here's cosh inverse of the natural log ln of 5. So I'm going to the formula again, the natural log uh, we had for Cauch inverse is ln of, uh, the formula is x, which is ln of 5, minus, uh, plus square root of ln of 5 squared minus 1. Okay, so first I have to work inside the brackets. So let me do this one. And I did. I just worked this on my calculator inside the brackets. And the answer I got is 1.0545. Let's take a look at part C. In part C, we want to evaluate tangent inverse of sinh zero. Okay, so that was uh, sinh of zero. Now sinh zero, you can plug it into the sinh formula. Sinh of zero is zero and tanch inverse, uh, we had uh, worked it out earlier, uh, tanch, yeah, see, sinh h, uh, sinh zero is zero. So for tanch inverse, I'm just going to use this formula again, which is one half, let me write it, this is going to be one half natural log of 1 plus 0 over 1 minus 0 and that's just 1 half ln of 1 natural log of 1 is 0 so that's just 0 and there you have it so here is exercise number 6 parts a b and c let's take a look at our next exercise next one we're looking at is exercise number 10 in number 10 we want to prove this identity. Remember the half angle identity. Sinh squared x is equal to cosh 2x minus 1 divided by 2. So let's take a look at exercise number 10. Okay, so here's number 10. Now prove this, I'm going to actually work uh, from the right side. Okay, so I'm going to write cosh of the double angle 2x minus 1 divided by 2. Now cosh 2x, we have the formula for cosh 2x that's going to be uh, cosh squared x plus sinh squared x, that's that, and uh, negative 1. Remember the identity we had would be Pythagorean identity for uh, cosh squared minus sinh squared equal 1, so I'm just going to replace 1 with cosh squared minus sinh squared x. Okay, so that's the 1 all over 2. And then here we can uh, cancel cosh squared. They turn out to be opposites. In the numerator, I have 2 sinh squared x divided by 2. The 2's cross out, giving us sinh squared x. So there's the identity. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Next identity is number 16, the sum formula for tanch. Again, it's, uh, it's very similar to, not exactly, but similar to tangent, uh, the sum formula for tangent uh, with uh, trig functions. So we're doing number 16 um, next. In number 16, let me write the problem. Okay, so here's number 16. Now the way we prove this is very similar to the way we prove the, uh, it would be equivalent, a trig identity for um, the sum formula for tangent. 
Okay, so usually with that proof, what we do is start with the sum formula for sine and cosine. So here I'm going to start with uh, cinch and cosh. Okay, so I'm going to write tanj of x plus y is equal to uh, cinch of x plus y divided by cosh x plus y. And both of these are in the list of our identities up above where we started. So for the sum formula, we get cinch cosh, that's cinch x, cosh y, and then plus cosh cinch. Uh, that was cosh x and cinch y divided by the denominator, which is the formula for cosh. That would be cosh x, cosh y, and then plus cinch x, cinch y. And at this point, the creative step is to, let's see, we're going to divide top and the bottom by, let's divide it by cosh x, cosh y. So let's say I'm going to divide by cosh x times cosh y. Now, when we do that, when we do that in the denominator, for example, dividing by cosh x cosh y. So I'm going to get 1 plus, this is going to become cinch x cinch y divided by cosh x cosh y. The numerator is cinch x cosh y divided by cosh x cosh y and of course next step I'm going to divide out cosh y next term cosh x cinch y divided by cosh x cosh y right and then here's the easy part let's see um, cosh x is cross out so in the numerator, we're going to have uh, tan x, right? Plus cinch over cosh will give you tan. That's going to be tan y divided by 1 plus cinch over cosh would be tan. So this will give me tan x, tan y. All right, and there you go. There is the identity, number 16. Let's uh, continue on. Next, we get into derivative differentiation. So we're doing numbers 24 uh, first. And number 24, y equal cotang 1 over x. Okay, number 24, y equal cotang of 1 over x. Now, let me grab the formula for uh, derivative of hyperbolic functions and uh, copy them here for reference. All right, so here are the derivatives and integrals of hyperbolic functions. So you want to find y prime. So y prime would be derivative of cotange. That would be right in here. It's going to be negative cosage squared. So that's negative cosage squared of 1 over x. And then times chain rule the derivative of the inside function, which will be negative 1 over x squared. We've done that before, so I'm sure everybody is comfortable with doing that. Negative times negative here makes positive, and we can write the answer in the form of 1 over x squared. That would be like your algebraic expression, followed by hyperbolic expression, 1 over x. There, pretty simple, huh? <laughs> That's number 24. And the next one we're going to look at is number 30. Uh, cinch 2x cosh 4x. Number 30. Um, we have, again, we have cinch 2x cosh 4x, right? f of x was cinch 2x times cosh 4x. So here we're going to use the product rule. Okay, and for the product rule, we're going to take the derivative of first, so f prime x. Derivative of cinch is cosh 2x, and then times 2, derivative of 2x inside, times, 
or um, yeah, that was derivative of first by second that's cosh 4x right and then plus first that's cinch uh, 2x times um, let me move that over a little bit um, times derivative of cosh which is cinch derivative of inside is 4 I'm just gonna put 4 cinch 4x the fact that derivative of cinch is cosh cosh is cinch that's good we don't have to worry about carrying a negative sign on one or the other and there's your number 30 for you there's really nothing else we can do with this um, maybe put two in front four in front and that's about it usually just just so we don't confuse again 2x times 2 that doesn't multiply so that's cosh 2x and then cosh 4x plus 4 cinch 2x times cinch 4x there that would be number 30 for you uh, next one number 30 we go to number 40 let me make sure yeah let's go to number 44 and then we do 50 number 44 we're doing tanch inverse of x over 2 okay number 44 uh, y equal tanch inverse of x over 2 so now let me uh, let me grab the formulas for derivative of inverse functions hyperbolic functions and there it is so we're looking at uh, tanch inverse so y prime is going to be 1 over 1 minus u squared so that would be x over 2 squared and then chain rule derivative of x over 2 which would be just 1 half remember we're doing 1 half times x derivative is just a half and uh, next I'm going to multiply 2 times the denominator 2 times 1 is uh, 2 right minus uh, x squared divided by 2 because x divided by 2 squared that's x squared divided by 4 when you multiply it times 2 becomes x squared over 2 now this is a complex fraction right so I'm going to multiply the top bottom of it by 2 to get rid of the half in the denominator and it becomes an ordinary fraction so that's 2 divided by 4 minus x squared and that is what the y prime ends up being number 44 okay this is number 50 now we have tangent inverse okay the one we just did i mean that was also tangent inverse so this is natural log of tangent inverse so g prime x first we take the derivative of natural log of u which is 1 over u that's 1 over tanj inverse x times derivative of the inside which is derivative of tanj inverse x just going to copy this formula times 1 over 1 minus x squared and of course du dx in this case because inside argument is x that's just one and for number 50 that's that's all <laughs> that's all you can do there's not much to this one let's take a look at the next one let's take a look at number 54 again in 54 the derivative involves cotange uh, so that's going to be uh, just like tanj inverse so look at this one tanj inverse look at the formula for cotange inverse they're exactly the same isn't that ironic <laughs> okay so first we're going to do the cotangent inverse and uh, y prime is you can do the product rule so it's going to be two times the derivative of x is one the derivative of first by second cotangent inverse 2x plus first times derivative of cotangent inverse right um, which is going to be one over one minus 4x squared that that's u squared and then du dx times 2 right that's the derivative of cotange 
inverse 1 over 1 minus u squared and then minus the derivative of natural log is 1 over square root of 1 minus uh, 4x squared and then the derivative of a square root so that's going to be uh, if I write 1 minus 4x squared square root of that as that to a half and I can take the derivative so that's going to be 1 half uh, 1 minus 4x squared to a negative a half times derivative of the inside which is negative 8x okay so that's just rewriting the radical now this one we could uh, simplify this a bit uh, let's see what can we do in number 54 so I can actually distribute the 2 outside the bracket that makes it 2 cotange inverse 2x plus uh, 2x 2x times 2 so that makes it what um, 2 times 2 4x so it's going to be 4x divided by 1 minus 4x squared right and then negative so let's simplify that thing the 1 minus 4x squared to a negative a half that would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus 4x squared right using negative exponent rule rewriting the power of 1 half the rational exponent half as the square root now um, and then this these two square roots multiply together and the consequence we're going to lose the radical sign the numerator is going to be negative 8x the denominator is going to be 2 and then times 1 minus 4x squared true and of course we're going to simplify that in a moment I realize recognize that there is a common 2 in there that we can divide out all right and let's let's do that so next step I'm gonna write 2 cotange inverse of 2x plus 4x divided by 1 minus 4x squared negative times negative is positive and then 2 and 8 gives you 4 that when you divide uh, so this becomes 4x divided by 1 minus 4x squared and notice these two are alike right we have like terms therefore the final answer is going to be 2 uh, cotange inverse of 2x plus 4 and 4 makes 8x divided by 1 minus 4x squared and there we have number 54 worked out for you okay now um, done with differentiation that's all there is to differentiation number 58 uh, 54 now uh, next segment we're going to take a look at a couple of integration and then an application and that's that's it will be done in number 58 the integral of tan checks okay number 58 the integral of tan x dx so let me bring the uh, our integration formulas down and then we'll work these all right so here it is these are the this is the table of basic hyperbolic functions integrals of hyperbolic functions now if you note tang actually is not in there that's what the question is asking us to do so to uh, to make it work with what we have actually I'm going to rewrite this as uh, the ratio of sinh x to cosh x dx right and then we're going to make a u substitution so I'm going to let u be cosh x and du derivative of cosh is sinh x dx so this integral is du over u which becomes natural log absolute value of u plus a constant and uh, so that means this is going to become natural log of uh, absolute value of cosh x plus a constant now if you recall the graph of cosh x uh, started at one and it kind of remember it looked like a parabola it went like this so cosh is positive always cosh x is always positive 
is y. This is 1. So, because it's positive, there is no need for absolute value. If, it's, if the argument of natural log is positive, there is no need for absolute value. The absolute value is there to ensure that the argument doesn't become negative. Because if it does, then, of course, uh, we are outside the domain of natural log and the function becomes undefined. And there we have that one. <clears throat> okay, now... Uh, you could, of course, you could let u be cinch x, okay, so um, if, if u is equal to cinch x, then du would be cosh x dx, right? So if I replace it now in the, in, in the numerator, I have uh, u but then see the trouble here let me write it i have u dx divided by cosh x you see that so i don't have cosh x dx and of course i can rewrite it as because uh, here um, du divided by cosh x would be the uh, it would be equal to dx if you don't want to do it this way by the way i just want to show you the complexity that it would result and now i can write this as u divided by cosh x uh, and then of course dx dx is going to be du over cosh x of course everything has got to be in terms of u correct <laughs> and u is cinch x so this is equal to u du divided by cosh uh, squared x now remember the identity is cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals one true so from this we get cosh squared x is one minus cinch squared x true and uh let's see what can i do next with this one um we could uh change and of course that's one minus u squared so the integral becomes u over one minus u squared du so notice that really didn't help us much did it at this point i would probably make another substitution right i'm gonna let i know m be one minus u squared and dm would be negative two u du and here's negative two so i multiply top by two divide by negative a half and so this becomes negative one half the integral of uh, dm over m and see how that works so it's taking us a heck of a lot longer to get to the answer that's negative one half natural log absolute value of m which means negative one half natural log absolute value of one minus u squared which means negative one half ln of absolute value one minus and u was cinch x so it's cinch squared x and one minus cinch squared x is cosh squared x so the answer is negative one half ln of absolute value of cosh squared x plus a constant of course every one of these has a constant and uh, of course, uh, let's see, you can say, but that's not what we got here, right? <laughs> the answer we got was ln of cosh x. True? So, um, how are we going to make it work? Um, let's see. At this point, uh, cosh squared, this is negative one half. Uh, I can write it as ln of absolute value. Well, I don't need absolute value because cosh is positive. Cosh squared x, right? Bring the two in front and it's going to be negative ln of cosh x plus a constant, right? Plus a constant. And so I do have that negative. So that means I missed something basic out. Let me Let me take a look from the beginning just to make sure everything looks good hold on mm. oh i see okay i got it right up here the identity is correct but when i add cinch squared this becomes positive 
so cosh squared is 1 plus so my m is 1 plus that means this is going to be positive there's no need for negative here and that's going to get rid of the negative in here here uh, everything else looks fine there negative is gone ne this negative is gone negative is gone gone and uh, and there you go so we get the answer so I, again i did it um just to show you that some choices are better than others so we can still get there to this answer we got it we got there really fast with that choice that we made use cosh x if we hadn't done that we can still get there it just takes us longer okay and we are done with exercise number 58 next let's take a look at uh in the list of exercises we're going to do number 62 and 64. let's take a look at this uh, and we have number 62 now so in number 62 i'm going to let make a substitution i'm going to let u be 1 over x what's inside the argument of such and tench so du is going to be negative 1 over x squared dx which is good you have x squared dx <clears throat> so that means the negative of du is indeed exactly 1 over x squared times dx so the integral can be written as that of such u tens u and then there's negative du right the negative because of that negative all right and the integral of such tang uh, is going to be negative such u so this is going to be negative of negative such u plus a constant which makes it a positive such and u is 1 over x plus a constant and we're done with number 62. the last one in the section and we are done uh, this last exercise number 64 the arc of the catenary y equal a cosh x over a for x between 0 and b is revolved about the x-axis show that the surface area and the volume of the resulting solid of revolution are related by the formula s equals 2 times the volume divided by a in number 64 okay so let me copy this problem down uh, and then we'll work it together all right so here is again a copy of that exercise now we know what the graph of cosh looks like right and we don't know what a is here but uh, just to keep it general and we're going to assume a is positive negative doesn't matter the process is the same process so let's say this would be uh, for now that would be the graph of cosh cosh x right so i'm going to call that to be y equal a cosh x over a it's some form of cosh function right here's zero from zero to b and let's call this b okay is revolved about the x-axis so the region in question is this region okay actually i'm sorry not the region they said the arc of the catenary okay so the arc is revolved about the x-axis all right uh, and there you go so this is the arc that piece of it right there is revolved now let's find uh, surface and volume of solid of revolution and then we answer the question so first uh, the surface of revolution s remember it's going to be 2 pi we revolve about the x-axis so it's going to be 2 pi from a to b of y ds and we had that from earlier in chapter that was from back in chapter 5. so limits of integration are going to go from 0 to b and then we have y now differential of arc length remember ds ds was square root of 1 plus y prime squared uh, dy 
or I'm sorry, dx in this case, right? Because we're revolving about the x-axis. And y here was the distance, right? That's y, the distance to, uh, to the curve. Okay, so this is going to be now y times the square root of 1 plus, let me write that, y prime squared dx. And then we put in the specifics. Now, uh, y, of course, is the cosh function, right? So that's going to be a cosh x over a times square root of 1 plus y prime. Well, the derivative of cosh is cinch, right? So it's 1 plus. But um, remember now, there is actually an a in front, right? Uh, so let me do this. Y prime is going to be a, and then derivative of cosh is cinch x over a times derivative of inside, which is 1 over a. So the a's cross out, so the derivative is just cinch x over a. So we have 1 plus cinch squared x over a, and then dx. Okay, next I'm going to bring out uh, this a in front of cosh. So it's going to be 2 pi a 0 to b of, now, uh, here's cosh x over a. Now, 1 plus cinch squared. Remember, cosh squared minus cinch squared x is 1, the identity. So, uh, cosh squared x is 1 plus cinch squared x. So we can replace the radicand with cosh squared x, right? And of course, we have x over a. So uh, the radicand is cosh squared. The squared root of that will be just cosh, right? So I have another cosh x over a dx. All right, and that was our Pythagorean identity would be it's really not a pythagorean identity but as close as it can come to good so let's we have 2 pi a 0 to b of cosh squared x over a dx okay now don't worry about integrating this and the reason i don't because it says show if you recall the problem it says show s is equal to 2v over a so let's find the volume now, okay? And then we'll see how it turns out. Now the volume of solid of revolution, we're gonna use disks for this one, okay? We're gonna use disks. So it's gonna be zero to b of pi, radius is given by y, is pi r squared, and then uh, dx. That's the volume of solid of revolution. Bring the pi out, zero to b y squared y was a cosh x over a and then it gets squared right that's pi y squared and then dx cool now we can write this as a squared comes out so it's pi a squared and then keep uh, the integrand the zero to b of cosh squared x over a dx so notice we do have uh, the same integral that we do uh, in here, right? Now, um, so I can, from here, from this expression, I can say, well, let me write that down here. So I can divide by pi a squared, pi a squared, this coefficient on the integral, right? The multiple of the integral. So a v over pi a squared is equal to the definite integral 0 to b of cosh squared x over a dx again don't go integrating this that's the hard way of showing this because i have exact same integral up here now let's substitute um, so this is what we just found let me box this thing so that's what the definite integral is. We're going to substitute for the definite integral up here in 4s. Okay. Um, so s is going to equal to 
2 pi a and then instead of 0 to b of cosh squared I'm going to replace it by times that v divided by pi a squared all right and let's proceed now we want to show what are we showing showing s equals 2v over a so let's uh, so we're on the right track s is equal to let's just multiply these when we multiply the pi's cross out uh, and this is going to be 2v and one of the a's crosses out right a and a squared leaves you just a in the denominator and that's what we showed so the surface of revolution is twice the volume divided by coefficient a on the cosh and and there we have it that is the answer to number 64. so hopefully you learned a lot i certainly did and uh, with that we are done with this video lecture